This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to 2400 documentaries and nonfiction titles free for one month by following the link in the description. This is the West End in Boston. Today the West End is home to hulking structures like an arena and city hall. But about 80 years ago it looked like this. It was an exceptionally diverse neighborhood with black and immigrant residents. It was dense with apartments, shops, churches, and schools. The difference between the West End of today and the West End of yesterday could not be more stark. What happened? In 1958 and 1959, the Boston Redevelopment Authority demolished nearly all of the West End. Here's what that looked like. It's just insane. How could a local government destroy over 50 acres of buildings owned by private property owners and transfer that land to public and private entities? It's possible thanks to a clause in the U.S. Constitution known as eminent domain. Before we dive into the West End story, we need to understand what eminent domain is exactly and how it can be used to wipe a neighborhood off the face of the planet. Here in the United States, eminent domain is a power enumerated in the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. It's this bit at the very end that says, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Just like everything in the Constitution, this clause is open for interpretation. For example, according to the courts, just compensation means the fair market value for the property paid in cash. The trickiest part of this clause are the words public use. What does that mean exactly? Sometimes it's pretty straightforward. Governments have used eminent domain to acquire property for national parks, dams, and canals. The federal government has even used eminent domain to acquire property on behalf of private entities, like railroads. Because governments can use eminent domain to transfer property to a private entity, the term public use should be really read as public benefit. Does the public stand to benefit from this transaction? If so, it's a justifiable use of eminent domain. The public use requirement isn't all that straightforward, though. One example of this is the concept of blight. Blight was a concept civic leaders loved to use to justify the need for urban renewal projects. Urban renewal is a federal program used to fund revitalization in urban cores. Initially, this meant removing substandard housing and replacing it with public housing, but the scope eventually widened to include a variety of public and private projects. City leaders would often claim an area was blighted and use it as a rationale for using eminent domain and transferring properties from poor property owners to developers, and they would often build projects for the wealthy, things like condos, performing arts centers, and shopping centers. According to planners, converting blighted areas into upscale districts benefited the entire city, not just those wealthy residents and shoppers. But what is blight? The term is borrowed from plant diseases that spread and kill plant tissue. Supposedly, blight is an urban disease and blighted areas can infect other neighborhoods and spread crime and vandalism. The only way to treat urban blight is to destroy it and replace it with something better. In Washington, D.C., the district's urban renewal agency had a plan to wipe out a blighted neighborhood and redevelop it. Within that area stood a non-blighted successful department store. The owners objected to being condemned and didn't want to leave the area. The case, Berman v. Parker, went to the Supreme Court in 1954. This is a seminal eminent domain case. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Urban Renewal Agency. According to the court, even non-blighted properties could be taken as part of a large-scale redevelopment scheme, and removing blight was a perfectly good reason to use eminent domain. Holdouts like Berman couldn't derail a redevelopment plan, even if that property wasn't blighted. The Berman ruling gave urban renewal agencies across the country nearly unlimited power to use eminent domain to destroy neighborhoods so long as they could claim an area was blighted and had a large-scale redevelopment scheme. The timing for the BRA could not have been better as they demolished the West End only a few years after the Berman ruling. The West End community was not well organized nor prepared for the unprecedented demolition on the scale of an entire neighborhood and didn't have the resources to fight back. Many residents didn't believe something like this could ever happen. You can't really blame them. In the end, over 10,000 residents were displaced. The residents were promised that they would be relocated in comparable low-rent apartments and new affordable housing would be built in the West End. Both of those promises were broken. Many residents ended up in worse housing than their West End homes, though the BRA denied it. According to them, less than 2% of families ended up in substandard housing, but an independent study found that 32% of residents ended up in substandard housing. Remember how I was saying that the concept of blight wasn't well defined and was often abused? This was definitely the case in the West End. Over 40% of housing units in the neighborhood were in good condition. One later mayor of Boston flat out said that the neighborhood was, quote, a typical neighborhood and not blighted. Perhaps most importantly, the residents just loved living there. One survey found that 75% of residents liked it and only 10% disliked it. That's a pretty good ratio no matter where you're from. Jerry Rapoport, the developer responsible for the redevelopment of the West End, 
remains unapologetic about what happened there. He didn't care about the quality of the existing neighborhood, but saw the West End as the best place to attract development dollars for the revitalization of central Boston. The plight of the residents was a secondary concern, if they were a concern at all. This is a common theme across urban renewal projects in the 1950s and 1960s. Poor and minority neighborhoods were seen as a disease that needed to be exterminated so that wealthy residents, shoppers, and business people could return to the central city. The irony here is that if a place like the West End had been allowed to survive, it probably would have been totally gentrified by now and filled with wealthy residents that BRA was trying to attract in the first place. Today, the West End Redevelopment Project is one of the most infamous examples of the abuses of urban renewal and eminent domain. The BRA destroyed a vibrant, low-income neighborhood to make room for housing former residents couldn't afford in this beast of a city hall. How is this a justifiable public use or public benefit? Luckily, everyone learned their lesson from the urban renewal era, and public agencies have reined in their use of eminent domain. Um, that's not quite true. Is that you, Mr. Beat, the creator of the Premier Social Studies channel on YouTube? Why, yes it is. Dave, I do believe you are forgetting the very important and very controversial Supreme Court case Kilo v. New London, which gave the government more eminent domain power. Oh yeah, that's right. Go check out Mr. Beat's video if you're interested in that eminent domain case that inspired a feature film. If you're interested in well-made videos and documentaries, I recommend you check out Curiosity Stream. When I joined Curiosity Stream, the first thing I did was search for videos about city planning and I was excited to find lots of videos on topics from cities of the future to ancient cities. I did a study abroad in Rome way back when, so I immediately gravitated toward this documentary all about the cool things under Rome, including aqueducts and sewers. I was sucked in pretty much immediately. And if for some reason you have interests outside of cities, Curiosity Stream has you covered. There are thousands of other titles on the service, including content featuring Stephen Hawking, David Attenborough, Jane Goodall, and more. A Curiosity Stream membership is ridiculously cheap, starting at just $2.99 per month. I know that you're probably subscribed to a lot of streaming services out there, but $2.99 is like a rounding error. And if you go to curiositystream.com slash citybeautiful, you get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series. If you enter the promo code CITYBEAUTIFUL when prompted during the sign-up process, your membership is completely free for the first 30 days. Signing up helps support the channel, so go check it out.